And if you stood back, if you were from another planet and stood back and looked at our community, you would probably be astonished that the overarching trope about gay men is about our vulnerabilities rather than our strengths. It takes a lot of nerve to come out. We're really good at homophobia management. You don't see me at a Trump rally. We, right? Think about the ways that we all manage homophobia. We, we have gone to the mat to create safe religious homes where we can be who we are in, in institutions that historically have been horribly homophobic. And we've turned that around and made a safe religious home for ourselves. We're good at finding and creating families, even though we have major societal institutions historically that kept us and were very exercised about keeping us from doing just that. We're great at community building. There has been a community of gay men in lower Manhattan since the days when Walt Whitman went off to go teach soldiers during the Civil War. And that community has reproduced itself for generation after generation, even though we, for as by and large, we're not having kids, which is the way that most cultures reproduce themselves. So we've been able to reproduce our culture outside of procreation. That's very unusual in human history. We've done activism for citizenship rights that's really impressive, even during the height of the AIDS epidemic when there were lots of, of kind of nasty people doing their best to kick us when we were down, and we still won. This is about heroism. This is about resilience. This is about strength. This is, and that we're not talking about this stuff in terms of gay men's health strikes me as really surprising. And even when you look at the at the medical literature that if you read between the lines, you can find resiliencies once you start looking for them everywhere you look. Like I said, there's tons of substance use, but hardly any of us, at least at, at any one point in the time, compared to all the drugs we're using, actually are reporting substance abuse problems that suggest addiction. Um, we may have, despite our still high rates of smoking, the highest rates of smoking cessation of any group I can find in the medical literature. We've really done a good job of smoking cessation. It's an untold story. Of course, the vast majority of gay men remain HIV negative throughout the lifespan, even though it's very easy to get infected in our community. And positive men remain productive and, and thriving, even while dealing with, it, with a dangerous infection. And there's a, big, there's a big story about the resolution of substance abuse careers, and on and on and on. I could probably mention other things. So even on the health side, specifically, there's a lot of resiliency there that people are not talking about. This is a slide from the multi-city AIDS cohort study, the MAX, where I've done a lot of work. And I've thought about this a lot. So these are our um, trajectories of, of uh, stimulant drug use, mostly meth during the height of the meth epidemic among gay men. These are about three years of date, and these are trajectories. So there's a group of guys right here, the purple line, who are the ones that you get on the front page of the New York Times. So these are the guys who are using speed at every, an amphetamine at every wave. There's another group of guys who are starting to join them. So they're doing what the DEA and our mothers tell us is gonna happen if we use these very dangerous drugs, right? But there's another group here who is quitting, and they're quitting on their own. And the way I know that is there are no effective treatments for methamphetamine addiction. So somehow they're doing that. And that whole, of all the thousands of papers that have been written about gay men and substance abuse, no one I, that I know of has ever talked really carefully about resolution of substance abuse careers. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then there's a group of guys who's, during the height of the epidemic, never touched this stuff. Notice that of the increasing and the uh, consistent use, that that accounted for about 16% of the sample. So the entire focus on meth and gay men and chem sex and all that stuff is talking about 16% 16, 16 of the gay male world, and we're throwing away the drug using or non drugging using experiences of 85% of the cohort. Think about that for a minute. What's going on with the guys who are declining use even during the height of an epidemic, and how are they pulling that off? What's going on with the guys who never touch this stuff and are exhibiting resiliency against a, a substance use epidemic during the height of it, and how do they do that? We don't know the answers to those things. So a central question is, should the evidence be based on the guys in the purple line at the top of the graph or the green line? 
the guys who are doing what we want them to do? Why aren't we learning from the guys in the green line and, and how they're reducing? And how would our intervention designs be different if we took the guys in the green lines or the guys who never, ever, never you know, did the risk to begin with, learn from those guys about how to support broader health in the gay community? Um, saying it in other ways, which insights are most valuable? It's about trajectories of increasing risk, the guys who are getting into trouble, or declining risk. And, and my real point here is that why aren't we using both insights to do the intervention designs? Um, a really important thing to think about is thinking about the guys in the purple lines or the guys in the blue lines, that the trajectories of risk production are probably really, really different than the trajectories of risk reduction. And so we, if we focused on the risk reduction piece of this, we would probably come up with novel intervention activities that we are not now doing that might speak more to the broader reach of the gay community. Remember the 85% that we're throwing away? And, and one of the things that happens, and you hear a lot with guys who go to our interventions, is that the, the idea is that, you know, this, why are you hammering on these things? This isn't true for me. And so by, by going after the things that are false assumptions with the deficit-based inter interventions and, and the false assumptions about where gay men are at, it introduces credibility and men are voting with their feet. That's why so many of our interventions are in rooms with lots of empty seats. Another piece of this also from the point of view of intervention efficacy, deficit-based approaches tell me what not to do, but they don't tell me what to do when I'm in a risky environment. They're negative skill sets. They're not positive skill sets. And that risk reduction involves ex exercising strengths and this focus on telling me not what to do as opposed to building up the strengths that I have to reduce risk doesn't help me over the long haul. This probably explains why so many of our interventions have very short time periods of efficacy. You know, the, most of the studies go for six months to a year because they're focused on the deficits. But if it's about building up resiliencies, building up the mechanisms that support risk reduction. These are skill sets that can be exercised even after you've forgotten all about the intervention and even when you're in a risky environment. Um, so this got us into resilience. Well, it, in public health, we're far better at um, defining illness than health. In fact, we're really lousy at it. And so the resilience definitions are kind of vague. Uh, this is probably one of the better ones. Um, but what we decided to do was, in collaboration with Fenway Health, was to throw a big meeting like this. We had about 200 people. And we sat for two days talking about what our gay men's resilience sees. And so it's not resilience, it's resilience sees, the multiple ways we access strength. So we're not saying people are strong because people are strong. We're saying people are strong because they can create a family. People are strong because they can connect with community in good ways. People are strong because they can um, deal with internalized homophobia better, and on and on. So we, had, we ended up with two to 300 ways that gay men are strong. It was a lot of fun. And we had a qualitative person go back and boil everything down to a whole set of mechanisms that we think should be incorporated into intervention design. So they're clumped at the individual level, the dyadic, the family, and the community. So these are some examples of the ways that we are strong. And then have, have, I think, explained how we've survived the AIDS epidemic as a community. Um, the other thing about the flipping the variables thing is that, is that you, it's, a lot of people, when they're doing this, they think, well, shoot, I'll just declare that somebody's not depressed, is resilient, and, and just flip the, the analysis that way. That's, that's a, a parlor game that won't get you very far. We believe that, the, that all of the variables having to do with resiliency, the things that you would define as being weaknesses, have very different content than the things you would have as strengths. So like community involvement. If your community involvement is on a, involved in a soccer team and sports team and your, con and your connection with the gay community is at 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, the content of your high level of community involvement is going to be very, very different than if your connection with the gay community is at 2 in the morning. 
And so how the content of this and the qualitative meaning of these things have not been very well explored. But to just flip the variables is, gonna, is not going to get us very far. We have to understand the differential meaning of these things um, as, 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 as variables. And so my point here being to the gay men in the group or any of us who have risk reduction issues, which intervention would you rather go to? An intervention where they tell us we need to improve our condom skills and show us how to put a condom on a banana? or sitting around with a group of gay men talking about what our internalized homophobia issues are and working with other gay men to deal with that. Mine would be getting in drag and going and arguing with the guy at the grocery store about the high price of lettuce this day, these days. <laughs> so I, I can't do that. Um, but if, if I do that, I will be zero on internalized homophobia, I guarantee you. So on a useful theory, I just, you know, it, we need to get better theor Interventions are in intensely theor theoretical. If I tell you AIDS is going to get you if you don't look out and hand you a condom, my theory is fear and condom availability reduce risk. Everything that we do is an intense theoretical test. So the smartest thing we can do around raising levels of health in our community is come up with a better theory. So what should it include? We need to do better than flipping the deficit-based variables. We need to understand the content of strength and how to measure this stuff and incorporate it in interventions. Obviously, we need to capture more variants. Um, we need to find variables that are conducive to intervention design. So if we, are, if we do think that building families and building relationships is good for our health, then we need to figure out how to support that kind of stuff in our community for men who want to achieve that. If we think that reducing internalized homophobia is good for our health, we can come up with really cool interventions, I bet, that would do just that and probably have bigger effect sizes than the condoms on the banana interventions. Um, we need to include variables beyond the individual level. Saying you're strong because you're strong isn't helpful. Saying you're strong because you can connect to community in, in helpful ways, that's helpful. And we can show men how to do that. So final thing is, you know, our communities have, ex have exhibited extraordinary resilience during a horrifying epidemic. Uh, we've been through a war. We have done really well. And, and it's a remarkable historical story. And, and that the overarching trope of what's going on with our community should not be vulnerabilities, but should be about resiliency and heroism, in my opinion. Um, I would argue that strength-based approaches are understudied, um, and that you need to do, and that if we're going to take that seriously, we've got to do multi-level interventions, and that it's time to address weaknesses and tap strengths in raising levels of health in our community. And that's it. Thank you.